Welcome to Healthcare Du Jour, where we dish up and digest the latest in healthcare. For the next 30 minutes, sit back as we bring you insight, commentary, and discussion on trending topics to the table, all expertly served up by our host and his guests. Healthcare Du Jour is brought to you by High Tech Answers and Healthcare Now Radio, part of the Health IT Answers Network, and by the law offices of Meyer McConnell. And now here is your host, Matt Fisher. Welcome back, and thank you for joining as we dive into the hottest topics in healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Fisher. On the menu today is Mac McMillan, Chairman, CEO, and Co-Founder of Synergistic. Mac, it's uh, great to be talking with you again. It's been, I think, all, all, just over six months since we last chatted at HIMSS at, back in March. It, it is, and it's, a good, it's good to, to hear you again, Matt, and it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, no, I think we have a lot to talk about coming, you know, thinking about cybersecurity and um, different security issues. But first, for people who aren't privileged enough to know who you are, would you mind giving uh, everyone just a little uh, brief introduction as to who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm, I'm as you said, the CEO of Synergistech, which is a firm that, that specializes in privacy and security uh, services, consulting services, primarily for the healthcare uh, industry. And I say primarily in, in the because now we obviously do business with quite a few business associates uh, who may not be providers or payers, but certainly uh, have a link into healthcare by virtue of the services that they provide to those organizations. Um, I spent 20 plus years in the federal government and grew up in that in that space, retired and came out to the private sector and and uh, been doing this for the last 16 in healthcare. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. Well, actually, kind of that comment which you just made where you said you kind of grew up in the government but have moved into the private sector, I think is a nice way to introduce the first topic I wanted to talk about, which is the uh, Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Task Force, which in and of itself seems to be combining both the public and private sectors. Um, so do you think we're getting any value out of that task force yet, or do you anticipate that we will in the near future? Uh, I hope so. Um, obviously, we don't know yet. Um, they've only had, uh, as my, I understand it, a couple of meetings. I know, obviously, several members uh, of that task force, and, and I've spoken to them uh, on a couple of occasions. Um, they're still in the process of gathering information, uh, which they're going to, which they're going to do for a while. I, I suspect that they're coming up close to a time when they're going to have to start putting some some thoughts to paper. Uh, because they have a report that they have to deliver in the spring. So my guess is that sometime around October, November, they're going to start uh, writing their report of whatever you know variety that is uh, and making their recommendations. I mean, obviously their focus is supposed to be on, on the CISA Act and how we're going to, and some ideas for how we're going to share threat information in the, in the uh, health care um, uh, industry. Uh, I'm, ho I'm also hopeful that they will take a look at the, the GAO report that just came out uh, this week that, that, in my opinion, uh, says in plain language something that's long overdue, which is we need a much better standard in healthcare, and the, and the HIPAA security rule is antiquated and doesn't cut the mustard anymore. Uh, hopefully that will find its way into, into, their, uh, into their analysis as well. But we're just gonna. I mean, we're gonna have to wait until the spring to see what those those folks produce. Right. No, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, it, it, taking a kind of one of the first points, which you said, which is they certainly seem to be in, still in information gathering mode. I saw. I think it was from Fred Trotter. The their kind of public solicitation for people to submit uh, information. Uh, so it sounds like you've actually had a little bit of an opportunity to do that um, by having spoken with some members of the task force. Um, will you be submitting any kind of more formal? Uh, comments or suggestions as well? No, I, I, um, I've not been asked to do that. I've just, uh, just by virtue of knowing uh, several of the folks on, on the committee, I've had, had an opportunity to speak to them. Uh, I'm sure they're talking to a lot of folks. I'm sure they're, you know, they're getting a lot of briefings by other folks in the government in terms of what's going on around in other departments where they're sharing uh, threat information with other industry sectors. Uh, I'm sure they're getting, you know, getting briefings from folks in the financial sector and energy sector and et cetera, you know, looking at how those folks uh, share information uh, with one another. Um, so 
we'll see. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but uh, you know, these political um, uh, task force typically, they're not really where the action happens, right? They come, they tend to come out with some big blue arrow type, uh, type ideas and, and recommendations, but somebody is still typically has to take that and turn it into something workable. So. Uh, this is, I think, this is kind of a first step, and, and my my biggest my biggest frustration, I think, with it, like like our like a lot of the providers out there, is you know, CISA came out last December, and we're sitting here in October, and we still don't have an effective way to share threat information across the industry. Right. So I guess from that perspective, and I remember seeing calls for this when kind of the committee was first being formed, which is, you know, any government task force is not going to be able to be nimble or quick enough to actually respond to, uh, you know, some of the threats that are arising and, you know, hopefully that this would spur the, you know, the private industry to organize itself. Are you, are you seeing any movement in that direction? There is, there is some movement in that direction. You know, the, the only problem with, with the, the private, you know, sector doing it itself uh, is that it, it tends to be disjointed, meaning there's pockets of it here, there, there and under, so to speak, as opposed to a, a, a concentrated um, effort in terms of addressing the industry as a whole. Um, you know, the thing I think that's frustrating to me is that is that we've solved this problem already in other industries. Um, we have um, sharing of threat information, like I said, in the finance in the financial sector. Uh, we have the finance ISAC and the and the multi-state ISACs that, that already provide threat information to their members. Um, you, you almost kind of scratch your head and say, why couldn't we grab one of those models, implement something, and then improve on it, as opposed to waiting a, a year before we actually figure out what we're going to do? Um, it's just, it's just, it's just that's. I think that's the part that's frustrating is that is that we've already done this before, and we're and we're treating it as if it's something net new in healthcare. Um, and it's certainly not. Yeah, and that's, that kind of feels like a common theme when you're talking about various uh, types of technology or technology-related issues when it comes to healthcare. Um, you know, I think in terms of you know the accessibility of information and the ability to share it, uh, that's another time or another topic where people say we can do it everywhere else in daily life. You know, why why is healthcare so far behind? Right. Yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, but we're studying it. We're going to figure that. Maybe they're going to figure that out and tell us why it's taking us longer to figure it out. I don't know. I guess. I mean, is there the possibility that by being, um, you know, arguably behind the curve, it will help healthcare learn from those other industries and maybe implement something that all of a sudden becomes, uh, you know, on the forefront that then other industries can learn from. Well, you know, Matt, I'd, I'd kind of like to think that those lessons have already been learned. I mean, the finance sector, for instance, has been doing this for well over a decade. Um, so um, I think there's been enough water under that bridge that we should we should already have those lessons learned. Um, you know, it's it's, uh, I, you know, it's not like it's not like they just started it and, and, and are learning things and now we're taking advantage of that. They, they've already done this and they've done it for a while now. So I mean, those yes, lessons I... should have been easy to pick up on. Yeah, no, I think that's a very fair point. And it's um, kind of an a interesting way then to kind of dive into ransomware, which obviously <laughs> has been and continues to be a, a hot topic. Um, and it obviously, you know, because I think both of us focus, as you were saying earlier, we focus on healthcare, so I pay attention to those stories more. But it does feel like healthcare experiences more um, Arguably successful ransomware attacks in other industries. Is is there a reasoning behind that? I, you know, I don't know that that's accurate. I um, I think ransomware is pretty much affecting just about everybody today. I mean, it's affecting people even in their in their homes, where where folks are being are, are being affected by ransomware on their on their home home computer systems, where their photos or their music is being encrypted and and ransomed back to them. Um, so it's affecting it's affecting everybody out there. I think I think the reason that it became so so um, I guess prevalent or obvious in, in healthcare is because of the because of the the, the 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 pickup in cases that we saw at the beginning of this year and, and because of some of the impacts of some of those those activities 
Um, you know, a lot of other industries today don't have to report when they have an outage or they have an incident of this type, whereas healthcare, it's a very public issue very quickly, right? I mean, if your right. hospital can't, can't see you uh, or can't treat you because their system is down, not only do you know it right away because people get turned away, um, but you also know it pretty quickly because that hospital has to report that. Um, your bank, your local bank or your or, or retailer could have a ransomware attack and you'd never know it um, because, number one, they don't have to report it to you. Um, so I, I don't think it's a, a fair assessment, uh, quite frankly, to, to say, I mean, if you believe the statistics with respect to the folks who are monitoring malware uh, traffic, if you will, across the Internet, um, you know, everybody is being hit with this onslaught of malware that has ransomware uh, 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 associated with it. Everybody is being victimized by, by social engineering attacks like water cooler attacks and phishing and spear phishing, et cetera, that have ransomware as, as, as a part of the payload associated with whatever the individual uh, inadvertently, you know, clicks on or downloads. Um, so I, I don't think it is just healthcare that's being affected. The problem is, is that when healthcare is, is affected, it's very public uh, and it becomes reportable very quickly. Um, so you're, you're just seeing a lot more of it in, in our industry than you do in other, other places. Yeah, no, and I think that observation is actually probably helpful and one that maybe most or other people are not realizing is, you know, that forced or and mandatory, as you said, public reporting within the healthcare industry. It's um, you know, kind of interesting on, on that point, one of the issues that I've heard around this is the fact that then when the healthcare industry um, has to report the attack, then they're also that, you know, that healthcare entity might then be subject to um, a fine from the government. I, it, I want to say it might have been from Athena Health or some other um, player in the industry saying, you know, it's kind of, you're, you're being hit with a, a double penalty where you've fallen victim to this attack and now all of a sudden you're getting fined as well. Well, I, you know, I mean, typically fines don't, don't come just because you've been attacked, right? Fines yes. typically spring from, you know, what they find when they investigate the attack, meaning what caused the attack. If, you know, if people have not done the right things in terms of, of protecting their environment, if they haven't educated their users, if, you know, if they've entered into business arrangements where they, where they haven't really uh, uh, formalized those properly with a business associate agreement or, or uh, and what, and whatnot, you know, typically the fines are associated with some, some form of noncompliance or, or, or some lack of, 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 of compliance or action on the part of the organization. Not, not just because they were attacked. The, the attack is what is what generates the the review, and it's yes. the, re, the results of the review that generate the fine. So, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good reminder. I was actually able to use a, a very similar point in a recent negotiation over a business associate agreement, um, where I was representing the business associate and got to, you know, get get the covered entity to back off on one of the points a little bit. Since uh, you know, I said, I don't want to have to cover your fines because, as you said. Just you know, the, whatever event gave rise to the breach, that just opens the door for OCR to come in and investigate, and then find you know, arguably find some other potential violation that is then usually the genesis for uh, the resulting fine that you read about in the settlement agreement, and then and um, results in you know having to implement some type of corrective action. Yeah, I mean, you know, looking at it from your perspective. Um, that's probably a very legitimate argument for you to make in, in the sense that um, really if you're going to hold me accountable, then you need to hold me accountable for something that I failed to do or some, or some negligent action that I took uh, as opposed to something that happened that neither one of us could have avoided or, or could have anticipated. Um, and so um, I, I get that. Um, so it's really, you know, really it's the, uh, when you start looking at fun things like fines and liability and and those types of things, it, it really, those generally are tied to somebody's actions or inactions, not necessarily an incident. The incident is just is just the event that sparks the review that identifies or uncovers the, the you know the lack of action or the or the wrong action. 
Right. Yeah. It, it's the he, it's the kind of the clickbait headline. It's what they put up front, but then when you actually read it, you fi you find out that there something you know very different gave rise to to the real concern. And so it's always interesting when you go in and actually read, uh, behind, you know, the full summary or the full document that OCR will post once they give that announcement that a, a final or a, that a finer settlement has uh, occurred. Um, yeah, and I tell yeah I tell people all the time don't 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 get don't get fascinated by the incident. Wait till you see the report. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes the investigation is much more interesting than than what caused it. Yes, no, I agree with you. That's where you can really learn the lessons that you can take home to to the other or to your entity or to uh, your clients and be able to say that you know th this is what they're looking at when they come in. It's um, you know some of those external events as you're suggesting are beyond your control and are something that everyone's facing. But you want to be able to show that you're taking the appropriate behind the scenes steps to help uh, minimize or because uh, I don't think we're going to be able to prevent uh, some of these attacks from being successful. No, you're not going to. You're not absolutely not. You're not going to be able to stop everything. Uh, there are some things out there that, quite frankly, we don't even have a means to stop. So, for instance, if it's a zero-day attack, for instance, where we don't even know that it exists yet, there's no, uh, there's no uh, cure for it or patch for it or, or uh, configuration that one can take to to avoid it. Um, and so, there's there's a certain amount. There's a certain percentage of risk. Um, that exists out there in, in, in the cyber world that, that quite frankly, that, that we don't know about until it hits us. Um, but we can certainly, you know, be smart about how we architect things. We can certainly be smart about our processes. Um, and we can, you know, we can certainly uh, avoid uh, as much of that as possible by, by using common sense and how we manage our environment. So kind of given what you just said, which, you know, that there are some threats that we don't even know about yet and some threats that we, that it's nearly impossible to do anything about, can, what, what suggestions do you give to entities in terms of what they should be doing to prepare themselves? So there's, there's several things. So, for, so first of all, uh, we need to do a better job of educating our, youth, our workforce members um, making them more aware of what you know, what's safe and what's unsafe. You know what they should be thinking about, what they should be paying attention to, what actions they should be taking when they see certain things, who they should be contacting, etc. We want them to be alert. We want them to recognize when there's anomalous behavior going on in the environment or with their system, and, they, and we want them to ask questions. And we want them to ask those questions of the right people so that somebody can take a look at it and figure out whether or not this is an issue. We need to do a better job in how we maintain our environment. We need to make sure that we move out antiquated systems as, as, as soon as we, we possibly can. We need to make sure that the systems we have are patched and hardened to the best of our abilities. Um, we need to make sure that they're configured properly. We need to control access in a smart fashion. We need to eliminate, to the extent possible, elevated privileges and things that hackers can use to really, really harm us if they get access to our environment. Um, and then we need to, we need to recognize that, that because there, there are vulnerabilities out there or threats out there that we don't know about yet, the only way that we're going to detect those is by having technologies in our environment that detect anomalous behavior or anomalous signatures. So instead of rule-based, just rule-based technologies, we need to have behavioral-based technologies. We need to have uh, advanced malware detection systems, if you will, that are sitting there looking at, at traffic uh, that's coming at our network and or across our network and say, is this good, bad, or do I not even do I not know this? And if I don't know what this is and it's and it's something that's unknown, then maybe it's something that I should I should put into a sandbox and test before I allow it to to either cross the transom or, or go across uh, my network. And then, last but not least, we absolutely got to, We have to have better contingency plans and recovery, uh, incident response, and and recovery. I mean, you look at the organizations that have have fared the best when it comes to to handling ransomware attacks when they have been infected. Uh, you should, and that's the organizations that have the ability to detect it quickly, respond to it, uh, and and then to restore their environment. Uh, very, very important. 
Yeah, no, kind of breaking apart, I want to break apart you know, the, that response you just gave, maybe picking up on the last point you raised first. I think we have two very recent examples from the news that help emphasize the point of what you just said, which is you need to be prepared and have the you know good contingency plans in place. Um, you know, the first one being Appalachian Regional Healthcare, which was down for close to three weeks, and then the story that I read about within the past day or two of, um, I believe, Keck Medical at University of Southern California, which had no interruption because it had appropriate backups in place. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's critical. People, people need to make sure that they have backups of all their data as well as their system configurations. They need to make sure they have a process in place to test those periodically to make sure that, that they're accurate, that they're up to date, that they're going to restore when they, when they need them to. Um, and they need to have really, really solid practices that they exercise periodically <clears throat> with the folks that are going to be responsible for those kinds of operations so that when something happens, they can literally uh, shut down the network or shut down that portion of the network, isolate whatever's going on, clean up, uh, you know, uh, clean up those systems and then restore them and get back up and running because the faster you do that, the less disruption you have to the organization and operations and ultimately the less disruption you have to your ability to, to do what's really important, which is to care for patients. So. Uh, you know, you, you can't stress enough how important good incident response and 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 recovery uh, are in this whole process. Yes, no, I definitely agree with you. And and kind of touching back to one of your earlier points, which even though I certainly um, don't disagree, that would be nice to see some updating to HIPAA and the privacy and security regs. At least, you know, having that incident response, that disaster recovery business resumption is is part of the security rule there. So it's, um, you know, I think that's part of, I, I suspect that we'll start seeing that as um, some of these breaches, or if they end up being seen as breaches occur and then have an investigation, you know, I, I think OCR hasn't necessarily um, picked on that element of the security rule yet um, to provide a lesson, at least not that I recall off the top of my head. No, but, you know, uh, OCR for some time now has identified uh, contingency plans and disaster recovery is a high priority um, area uh, that that they that they say from an, from uh, a compliance perspective is an area that the industry needs to uh, focus on uh, more closely uh, and I and I certainly echo that with respect to our experiences working with healthcare organizations across the country. Um, you know what's interesting about about these um, incidents that we've had. Um, is that we're learning some new lessons here, and that is it's not just about restoring the system, restoring the data, uh, recovering in that fashion, but it's also making sure that we have really good downtime procedures, but more importantly that we have individuals who understand how to operate when they don't have a system, where they don't have access to that data. Um, and, and, and there have been numerous examples of, uh, given lately of where these organizations have been down for long periods of time, meaning a week or more, if you will, or several days or more, um, where they've had a lot of employees who, quite frankly, didn't know how to do their job without a computer-aided aided device. Um, you know, stories of nurses who didn't know how to mix, mix uh, doses for uh, medicines to give to patients. Uh, stories of doc, young doctors who didn't know how to write a script without a <laughs> without something being on a pad, um, and you know, when I hear those kinds of things, that's really concerning because what that means is that we're not teaching, we're still not teaching those skills to those medical professionals that they need to have if they all of a sudden find themselves in a situation where they don't have a computer or they don't have a handheld device. Um, and they actually have to write something or do math um, to, to, you know, to convert uh, milliliters to, to ounces or, or what have you. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's something that we need to think about. We have an entire generation of workforce members that are, that are in, the, in the workforce today, you know, people that have been in the workforce, say, less than 15 years, um, that for the most part, throughout their lives to include their college careers, 
they've never been in a situation where they didn't have a computer-aided device to assist them with just about everything they do. So all of a sudden, when they find themselves in, without a computer, without a handheld device, without data that's readily available to them that's computed by a program, that they actually have to go look up in a book or a table and then figure out what to do with it. Um, we're not, you know, obviously we're not teaching those skills anymore, or we're not teaching them to the to the degree that we need to be, so these so these folks can actually function when they lose their system. And no, I think that's a, a interesting point because you know I think I fall into your category of uh, the the individuals who have been in the workforce and have have had certainly in my professional career I've always had the profession the electronic backup. But what was interesting when I was in law school, my first year, instead of you know initially instead of giving us full access to the online uh, legal research databases, they actually forced us to learn how to do um, book research in the libraries, which was a lot which was different than some of my friends at other law schools. But it goes to your point of if I don't if I lost an elect electronic access, at least I know how to go about and do case research and um, you know legislative or statutory research because I got that training in school, which you know, I think I agree with you is seems to be a missing component in a lot of different professions, whether we're talking healthcare, legal, or uh, elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's critical, and I think one of the things that our health, health organizations um, need to focus on today with respect to their preparation or their readiness if you will, is they need to have exercises where they literally say, okay, there's no communications today. How are you going to get things done? Um, the system is down. We're not going to have access to any of our information or, or, or our clinical systems for the next six hours. What are you going to do? How are you, how are you going to do this? Um, and, and, and actually exercise these things. I mean, we have to, we have to start recognizing that cyber incidents are, are here to stay and they're, they're a part of what can affect our business and affect our ability to, to get things done. And we need to start incorporating those into our overall risk management program that says, we don't just exercise the, the local you know, school bus accident where we're going to get 150 patients right away and we have to figure out how to put them through the ER and, and take care of them, which is important, no doubt about it. Um, but we also need to exercise cyber events. We need to we need to put we need to put our staff in those positions where where it's non-threatening for them to learn and become comfortable with what are they going to do if they find themselves in that situation for real. It's unfair to them. It's unfair to patients. It's unfair to the organization to have those people experience that firsthand in a real incident where people where, where care is on the line. Yeah, no, and I think that call to action is great and. Uh, you know, I, I can't believe it, but we're already out of time. So I, I'd really like to thank you, Mac, for joining. Um, you know, given the, the extremely fast pace and ex, you know constantly developing area, I hope we'll be able to have you on as a guest again and at some point in the near future. I look forward to it. You guys do a great job. Thanks, Matt. All right, and thank you to everyone for listening. Keep the dialogue going and connect with me at hashtag HCDEJURE. I'm Matt Fisher. Until next time.